Episode 126, The Irrational Lover. After bidding Lily goodbye and promising her one last time that she would return tomorrow, Zoe left the room with a smile across her face. She walked down the halls, humming to herself now that she had found a companion to talk to the entire day. Lily even gave her some pretzels to take back to her room. She happily hummed her favorite song, hands full of snacks, completely unaware of Ryan, who was waiting for her. We're no strangers to love, you the rules and so do I, she sang to herself, walking to her room. She looked down and wondered if Ryan liked pretzels. A full commitment's what I'm thinking of. A quiet voice finished the next part for her. Oh, you know the song too. Her voice died down when she realized exactly who finished the lyrics for her. The pretzels slipped from her hands, loudly clattering onto the floor. Sitting by the window of her room was none other than Ryan. The moonlight falling on his face added a ghostly tint to his tan complexion. She shivered when his eyes fell upon her. She didn't like the way he looked at her. The usual warmth and adoration he had in his eyes for her had evaporated faster than the sun behind thunderclouds. She swallowed nervously, her eyes shaking when he stood up. His hands were tucked in his front pocket, and his lips were pulled into a thin line. Even with the distance between them, she could still feel the murderous intent surrounding him. Her blood drained as he began to slowly stride towards her. Her heart thumped erratically within her chest, building up speed with each passing second. She turned around, ready to run, but the door behind her was slammed shut, locking her inside the dark room. With nothing but the moonlight as her guide, Zoe could barely see her surroundings. The only thing she could see was Ryan stalking towards her, as a predator would to their prey. You sure have a lot of guts causing harm to my men, making them run in circles, leaving this room, and not returning the entire day. You also missed your daily medicine. His deathly calm voice was beginning to scare her. She felt the hair on her skin raise at the tone of his voice. It was so sinister that she finally understood why he ruled the underworld. His aura, his presence, it commanded your obedience. You don't understand. I hate the hospital. Bite me. You said those words, did you not? You have no right to be angry with me. She nervously looked at him. He was just an arm's distance away from her. She could see his eyes more clearly now. His lethal stare was piercing, as if he could see right through her soul. Your actions will not go unpunished. There was a stillness to the way he enunciated each word. Her heart raced faster. She swallowed back whatever snarky replies she wanted to toss at him. She needed a way of calming this fury of his, and she already had the perfect plan in mind. Tell me, how would you like to be bitten? Perhaps I should start with... He was interrupted when she suddenly crossed the distance between them, wrapping her tiny arms around his body. He stiffened, her actions taking him by complete surprise. He blinked. What are you doing? Ryan, she adoringly said, her voice light and sweet as honey. It was soft, like summer rain, but airy as the clouds. The way she said his name filled his chest with warmth, his anger faltering. This little plan of yours isn't going to work. Ryan, I'm cold, she muttered, her voice becoming tiny and quiet like a child. She buried her face into his chest, rubbing her cheeks against the silk material. You think this will work? Won't you hug me? She whispered, lifting her head to look up at him. Her heart skipped a beat when she looked into his soulless eyes. She opened her eyes wider, her bottom lip slightly jutting out to resemble a tiny pout. Won't you? She pestered him, squeezing her arms in emphasis. His eyes narrowed into slits as he glowered down at her. Seeing that her plan wasn't going as she had hoped for, she deepened her pout and widened her eyes further. I'm really, really cold. Why aren't you hugging me? When he didn't move his arms, she decided to change to plan B, the irrational lover. Fine, let me freeze to death, catch a cold, and then cough myself to death. You won't get sick. It's above room temperature in here. But I'm so cold. I'll definitely get sick.
sick. When I'm on my deathbed from the illness I catch, will you take responsibility? She saw his anger converting into confusion. Don't be so dramatic. You won't die from a simple cold, he said, rolling his eyes at her stupid words. Die from a cold? Not on my watch. Fine. I guess I should put that theory into use and take an ice bath to catch hypothermia. She angrily said, dropping her arms as she turned her back and stomped her way into the bathroom. Seeing her determined to walk away, Ryan panicked. He could see all of his hard work crumbling in a flash before his eyes. Instantly, he pulled her into his embrace, her back crashing against his chest as his arms wrapped itself tightly around her. He was anxious that if he ever let go, she would disappear in the air like dust. He was worried she would never speak to him again. She was struggling in his arms, which confirmed his fear. He hugged her tighter, pressing her entire body onto his, leaving no room between them. Let go of me, she frowned. Zoe knew she was taking a gamble by pretending to be angry, but she needed him to be distracted or else he might become furious again. His chest prickled with pain at her reaction, his heart dropping at her words. Don't go, I'm not mad anymore, he hurriedly said, burying his head into the crook of her neck. She wriggled and pushed at his arms, which only prompted him to hug her tighter than ever. I'm sorry. She immediately stopped struggling. Did, did she hear herself correctly? D did the almighty Ryan just apologize? She tested the waters, her voice doubtful. Sorry for what? Seeing her no longer struggle in his arms, he relaxed. For everything. He pressed his lips to the crown of her head. What's everything? For getting mad at you, preventing you from leaving this room, and not hugging you back. He readily said, eager to please her. He didn't think he was this type of lover, but she always brought out this side of him. Surprisingly, he loved it. Despite the fact that she was stubborn beyond words, he loved that part of her. Zoe blinked at his words. She didn't think her plan would actually work. Who knew the outcome would be so perfect? I'm sorry, so don't go. Don't leave me, he hurriedly said, fear gripping his heart, painfully squeezing it. He was terrified she would leave him again, as once she did in the past. He was determined to not let that happen again. Episode 127, A Hypocrite. Zoe felt her heart melt at his voice, which was tiny and meek, like a terrified child. She felt her heart prickle at his behavior. Her brain chastised her for going so far, and her heart screamed to comfort him and ease his fears. Will you do it again? She quietly asked, rubbing circles on his large and rough hands. Immediately, his fingers grabbed hers, completely entwining the fingers together so that they were holding hands. Her heart skipped a beat at his action, a tiny smile on her face. I can't promise you a definite no, but I will try my hardest to be lenient. He snuggled his head on her shoulder, breathing in her lovely smell. It clouded his brain, the soft lavender scent teasing him. She was quiet for a moment, which prompted him to give her a squeeze. Are you still mad at me? She asked him, to which he shook his head. No. She smiled, happy that she was finally able to tame his anger, even if it was through unethical measures. She turned her head so that her cheek was resting on the crown of his soft hair. Good, because I'm not mad at you anymore either, she teased. He heaved a sigh of relief. Then hug me again, he demanded, wanting to feel her arms around him again. It brought him reassurance that she wasn't going to leave him. Zoe was surprised by a sudden request. In her confused state, she turned around and lightly hugged him. She yelped when he hugged her tighter, crushing her face to his chest. Um, Brian, don't walk away from me like that. I hate it. He ground his teeth, remembering the past when he came back to the country to catch up on things with her. He spotted her at a banquet and tried to approach her, but she freaked out and ran away her reaction leaving him completely heartbroken. Ryan, she began, lifting her head to look at him. I won't walk away, as long as you don't try to tie me down. 
When she saw his softened gaze harden, she reached up to gently caress his face. I don't like it when you're overly domineering. I don't like it when you're so bent on confining me like this. She watched his stare intensify further. He wasn't pleased to hear her words, but she didn't care. She needed to draw the boundaries if they were going to enter a relationship. I have so many scars from my past. I'm trying to move on, but it's so hard. I've been controlled by my parents in the past. I, I don't want a relationship like that. Her voice became shaky when she thought back to the days where her parents dictated her every move. Each note she misplayed on the piano was a slap to the back of her knees. The fear of being controlled like a puppet scared her. All she ever wanted was freedom. She understood her push and pull behavior in this relationship wasn't healthy, but neither was his domineering behavior. Ryan pressed his lips together, her words echoing in his mind. She thought his caring behavior was confinement? The idea angered him. I can't make any promises. It's in my nature. Well, neither can I promise not to run. The more you tie me down, the more I want to leave. He scowled at her words, ready to open his mouth and give her a piece of his mind, but he decided against it. If he said the wrong words, she might push him away and stop hugging him. He quite liked having her body against his. Her skin was always cold for some odd reason, and to him who gets hot easily, hugging her was extremely comforting for his overly warm skin. I know you don't like the hospital, but you have to understand. Staying in here and resting is for your own good. You're too stubborn to ask for help, so I have to intervene and do it for you. Did he view her as a child? Why was he so persistent in keeping her here? She could recuperate somewhere else with a personal doctor. Anything was fine, as long as it wasn't this chemical-filled room brimming with painful memories. Her voice turned bitter. I don't need your intervention. His eyes became grim. Don't be stubborn. You're a hypocrite, she deadpanned, but inwardly cursed herself because she too, to some extent, was also hypocritical. You demand me to not be stubborn, but here you are again, also being stubborn. Why can't you respect my wishes? She paused, thinking back to the way she reacted when he rejected her request prior in the day. All I wanted to do was take a stroll in the gardens. I could have asked nicely, but you wouldn't allow me to do so. His frown deepened. She was right. He wouldn't have allowed her to leave, regardless of how she asked him. I'm not a child, Ryan. I can take care of myself. I don't need you to constantly hover over me like a watchdog. She added on. His face darkened, lifeless and arctic. His eyes emitted an intent to kill. His fingers dug into his palm and his jaw tightened at her words. It was one thing to call him stubborn, but to insult him by calling him a hypocrite was something that couldn't go unpunished. All he wanted to do was care for her, to protect her, to keep her safe, to make sure she properly healed. And here she was, blatantly ignoring everything he was doing for her. Fine, do it your own way. Without another glance in her direction, he stormed to the door. The door slammed open with so much intensity, the wall behind it cracked. She jumped when the door slammed shut. It sounded like a gunshot. The power he used to slam the door shook her heart, sending it trembling in fear. But she was equally, if not more, stubborn than he was, and perhaps that was their biggest flaw. Stubborn brute, she muttered under her breath. She ignored the prickling pain in her chest the yearning of her heart to chase after him. She felt her heart was being torn to pieces as thousands of needles rained upon it. She wanted to ignore it. She wanted to forget it, but she couldn't. She grabbed a vase beside her and tossed it at the door. The porcelain shattered, startling the men outside. She refused to cry. She refused to give him the knowledge that he had hurt her. She inhaled deeply and practiced the tricks her therapist taught her didn't take long for her eyes to dry up. She refused to cry for him. Walking to the door, she flicked on the light, but something caught her by surprise. There were a few bags on the floor near the couch and coffee table. When she took a few steps towards it, a delicious scent wafted over to her. Her mouth watered when she saw the massive array of food laid out on the coffee table. 
she had wanted to eat with her. Her chest prickled with guilt, and for the slightest second, she hesitated. But her frustration came back when she saw the shattered vase. She reluctantly packed it all up, took the bags, and brought it out to the bodyguards. They were surprised when the door flew open. Instantly, they formed a human barrier, one thicker and stronger than the previous one. You guys must be hungry standing outside. I'm too full to stomach these foods. Please, have some. She passed the bags of luxury food to the men, who looked at her in bewilderment. Even a fool would recognize the quality of the French restaurant, Menton. A simple appetizer there was worth a few hundred, and from the size of the bag itself, the food must have cost at least a few tens of thousands. Um, ma'am, are you sure? If you don't want the food, toss it. I can't stomach food in my current state, she briskly said, not in the mood to stand here and convince them. She closed the door and flicked the lights back off. The bodyguards exchanged glances with each other. It's too expensive to go to waste, someone said, which earned chimes of agreement. Half reluctantly and half excitedly, they began to eat the dishes. Zoe waited a few moments before going to her bed and stuffing the pillows under her blankets. She seized the bodyguard's momentary distraction to quickly grab her phone, go to the corner of her hospital room, and call someone she didn't think she would ever contact again. Episode 128, You'll Dirty Your Hands. Joshua anxiously waited inside the car, his face pale with worry. His boss had stormed out of an important meeting just to go to the hospital, but it had been a few hours already and there wasn't any response from him. He had sent a message to him several times, but none of them received a response. Mr. Bing, boss is coming out now. Charles spoke up, noticing a very prominent and tall figure strolling out of the hospital, catching all attention with each step he took. When Joshua saw the fury on his boss's face, he nearly wailed in fright. What happened inside? Angry eyes were just the beginning. Then came the powerful strides, the slamming of the car door, and the command to turn the car back around and head straight to the underworld base. After reaching the base, Joshua quickly scrambled out of the car to open the door for his raging boss. Ryan stormed down the halls of the base. Sam was polishing his daggers when he received word that Ryan was on his way here. His eyes lit up with glee at how early Ryan had arrived. He eagerly walked up the stairs to greet his big boss. Big boss! He paused in his steps when he saw the displeased expression on Ryan's face. Sam was used to his boss's reserved and apathetic behavior, but he was not used to seeing such a hauntingly dark expression on Ryan's face. Even Joshua seemed to be sweating buckets as his eyes darted to him. Ryan wordlessly stalked down the stairs, a heavy air of death around him. Sam and Joshua could only helplessly follow after Ryan, nervously holding their breaths in fear that one wrong movement would tick him off. Ryan walked straight into the room, ignoring the people that greeted him along the way. His eyes were a storm that swallowed the entire place whole, raining down hell upon whoever was daring enough to cross his path. That stupid, foolish, stubborn woman. He inwardly cursed in every language he knew. How could she call him a hypocrite? How could she treat him so roughly and crudely when all he wanted to do was help her? She waited until now to point out how much she hated his demanding and controlling ways. She should have known better, for he was always like this in the past. Why was she so angry at it now? He ground his teeth, his jaw tightening in frustration. Did she not understand how worried he was for her? He cared about her so damn much, and yet she dared to use his kindness against her. Never again, he thought to himself, this time refusing to yield and be the first one to chase after her. He chastised himself for allowing her to run rampant and do as she pleased. His patience for her was supposedly limitless, but when it came to such important matters that concerned her life, it was very thin. He could only tolerate so much. When he sauntered into the room, filled with a smell so revolting, the guards outside nearly gagged. However, Ryan's eyes flickered with surprise. He didn't even realize where he was going, but this was perfect. 
He could vent his anger on the man here. He swiftly turned towards Joshua. Reports on Silver Crown. Joshua felt his brows tug together. Boss, you didn't ask for a report. His voice trailed off when he was met with a blood-curdling glare that was much scarier than facing death itself. He felt his entire body paralyzed by the menacing stare. I I'll work on it right away. Without waiting for Ryan's reply, he hurriedly left the room to fulfill the order. Ryan strolled towards the table filled with an array of weapons. Sam noticed his hands were bare of any leather gloves. He was perplexed to see this. His boss always came here in gloves. What made it so different this time? Just as Ryan was about to touch one of the daggers, Sam stopped him. Wait, big boss, you'll dirty your hands! He rushed over, but Ryan ignored his warning and just picked up the closest knife he could find. He pressed a button on the table that immediately splashed boiling water down on the man who had fallen asleep. Ah! He screamed as the scalding water burned his body. He convulsed, the chains he was being suspended from clattering loudly. Well, why did you d do that? The man shrieked. Ryan twirled the dagger in his hand. What is the purpose of kidnapping her? His stare was bone-chilling and out for blood. The man cowered back in fear, his eyes shaking as he bit down on his tongue to prevent him from stuttering so much. We were only s supposed to beat her. Why? T to be used as an exchange. An exchange? Ryan was surprised by the news he had just heard. What kind of exchange? We were supposed to beat her into oblivion. Ah! He screamed in pain when Ryan suddenly chucked a knife straight through the man's shoulder blades, tearing the muscle and skin. When he saw Ryan ready to toss another knife, he hurriedly spoke up. Wait, I have more to say! He wailed, his brain clearly broken to the point of no return. We were supposed to beat her so that she would be submissive when the exchange comes. Whoever wanted her, her kidnapped had plans to sell her off. Ryan thought over his words. Sell her off? That was impossible. With Richard's iron grip on his granddaughter, not a soul would be spared if she went missing. And if she was sold through the underworld, he would immediately intercept it. But, but that's not the end of it. But whoever was planning this wanted her to be sold out of this country for marriage to a place where her face would be unrecognizable. The temperature in the room suddenly dropped upon the mention of the word marriage. No one dared to move or make a single sound when they noticed how dark Ryan's face had become with rage. Who is the partner? The, the highest bidder. The man coughed with no way of covering his mouth. Blood dribbled down his lips. Which auction ring? The man opened his mouth to speak when, suddenly, a loud commotion could be heard outside the room. When Ryan turned around, he saw gunshots being fired. And right when he drew his own gun, a bullet flew into the room, piercing the hanging man right through the skull. A clean and effortless kill. Seconds after, the assassin had killed himself. Episode 129 Take a guess. The room turned deadly still. Not a single sound could be heard. The temperature dropped and the air turned chilly. A frigid and emotionless look took over Ryan's face. No one knew what their boss was thinking of, and they were too scared to speak up. They could only hold their breath and wait for his next command. Sam looked at the dead body, a small pout on his face. His toy was ruined now. That's fine. Big Boss will bring me another one. After what felt like a decade of silence, Ryan spoke up. Clean this mess. He walked out of the room, closely followed by Sam. Yes, sir, his men replied as they hurried to fulfill his order. Joshua was furiously typing away on the computer, attempting to finish the report when the door slammed open. He jumped in fright and turned around to see a stoic Ryan. Uh-oh. The calmer he was, the angrier he was. This wasn't a storm anymore. It was a typhoon. He hurriedly stood up, nervously gulping. Boss? Where's the report? Joshua nearly cried inside. He was only halfway done with it. 
Why did the investigation end so quickly? It's not complete yet. When Ryan's soul-piercing eyes landed on him, he panicked. I just need ten more minutes and I'll be done soon. Never mind the report. We're heading to their base. Ryan wasn't in the mood to sit here and read papers. He'll personally visit Silver Crown. Wordlessly, he walked out of the door, Joshua hurriedly chasing after him. Ryan got into the car and told Charles the location. Charles nervously glanced at his boss, noticing the lack of people accompanying them to Silver Crown. He knew Joshua and Sam were accompanying them, but that's it? Silver Crown might have been a mediocre clan, but with only three subordinates, he was worried for his boss's safety. Not daring to speak up, he could only press the gas. Ryan grabbed his phone, sent out a message, and then placed it down shortly after. In an enormous room were several men with a silver tattoo on one of their wrists. Alcohol was being passed around, and frequently, there was the sound of people clicking glass with each other. The air was heavy with the smell of cigarettes, burning liquor, cheap perfume, and sweat. Loud music boomed in the background as curvy and petite women danced on poles, their hourglass-shaped bodies perfectly swaying to the beat of the song. A few other women were securely sitting in the laps of burly men, trying their best to satisfy their every whim and wishes. Boss, I heard the mission two weeks ago was a failure! So what if it's a failure? We still got our money! A chubby man with an enormous beer belly laughed. He had a thick cigar hanging from the side of his mouth, and his two arms were both securely wrapped around the tiny waists of ladies the same age as his daughter. Man, that bastard sure had a thick wallet. He cashed out two million like it was nothing. Someone else spoke up, gesturing to the enormous stack of money on the table. Whoever commissioned them was surely new at handling these types of businesses. Who gives out the full payment without knowing if the operation was going to be successful or not? It's always the rich ones who are crazy. The boss, Flynn Moore, commented, taking a long drag from his cigar and then blowing it into the faces of the women by his side, who tried their best not to cringe back. This is why businessmen aren't to be trusted. They're secretly more crazy than us. She was a pretty one, too. Dazzling face, sexy body. Tch, what a waste. Flynn shook his head in disappointment. When he got a picture of her, he was thinking of dealing with the woman himself and having some fun with her first. Instead, his foolish subordinate suggested he let Liam handle it. Not only did they fail the mission, but they were stupid enough to let her get away. Luckily, it had been two weeks since then and nothing bad had happened to them yet. The tiny gang was immediately wiped out by Silver Crown. Right as Flynn was reaching over to take a sip of his expensive XO, the door of the room slammed open. Before any of the men could react, red laser dots were aimed throughout the entire room, freezing everyone on the spot. Flynn was unfazed by the laser. Who had the balls to target them? He continued to drink his XO, and right when he was about to place the glass down, a bullet shot through it. This pissed him off. The alcohol splashed onto his limited edition Gucci shoes. Youngsters these days are so damn bold. He sighed, reaching into his waist and pulling out a pistol. Seeing the weapon, the women in his arms instantly scurried away. Put away the damn laser. You think that'll scare Flynn? He snarled. He flicked two fingers and instantly his men were armed with guns. Which idiot sent you? He stood up, burped that his fun was ruined like this. Ryan's men immediately stepped aside, creating a path as Ryan strode in, the coat hanging off his shoulder, fluttering with each menacing step he took. The minute he entered, hands tucked into his front pockets, eyes lifeless, and a face cold as stone, the temperature in the room plummeted. The air turned stifling and suffocatingly heavy. Flynn shuddered upon seeing who it was, the gun clattered out of his hand. One deadly glance from Ryan was enough to terrify Flynn. Flynn turned towards his people. Fools, drop your guns. He hissed at his men, who were too frozen on the spot to move. Ryan's emotionless eyes scanned the room. His very presence was overwhelming to Flynn, who was beginning to sweat buckets. 
His palms grew clammy in dread as he nervously rubbed it on his trousers. Mr. West, how may Silver Crown help you today? He asked, his eyes scanning the men he brought. On his way here, Ryan had mobilized the entire Imperial team to storm the place. He had an endless variety of underlings and resources spread throughout the country, some even penetrating foreign lands. The Imperial team comprised the best of the best, each person's identity perfectly hidden. Many of the people of the underworld thought the Imperial team was just a myth passed down through generations to keep people in check, when, in reality, it had always been active, hidden in the shadows. Joshua, who walked in together with Ryan, was the first to open his mouth. He did the talking when it came to these things. His boss didn't need to waste his energy or breath on conversing with these useless pests. Take a guess. Glenn anxiously swallowed the lump in his throat when his eyes landed on the deadly weapon. He was no stranger to guns, but the one that Ryan had wasn't a simple one. Judging from its intricate design, it must have been a custom-made one. It looked like an advanced version of the Mark 19. Gun wounds always hurt like hell, but the ones made by Ryan's were perfectly deadly. Once they pierced a person, the bullet would shatter within the body, making it impossible to remove. That pain alone would have people begging for death over mercy. Episode 130, Wrong Woman. Mr. West, I'm not sure of the purpose of your visit. Silver Crown hasn't interfered with the West Clan's business. Bleeding gun. Ryan spoke up, his icy eyes landing on the pathetic man in front of him. Flynn paled upon hearing the name of the small gang he wiped out. Of course he knows them. But what do they have to do with this? What did they do to offend Ryan and even make him mobilize his elite team? Yes, they were a small gang working under us. Flynn stammered. He cursed in his brain. Oh, hell, I'm older than him. Why do I have to show respect to this little junior? But he didn't dare to voice this thought out loud. If they've offended you in any way, Mr. West, Silver Crown has completely wiped them out already. Flynn was, in all honesty, immensely terrified of offending the Great West Clan, who could wipe them out with the flick of a wrist. Destroying Silver Crown would be child's play to someone like Ryan. This is exactly where you offend us, Flynn. Joshua shook his head, like a father reprimanding a child. But of course, that's only a small part of it. His eyes scanned the room, landing on the large sum of money on the table. Flynn followed his gaze that was on the cash. Mr. Bing, here, you can have all of it. He hurriedly gestured for his men to place the money into the suitcases. Why, if it's just money, I have plenty more that I can give. You think we lack money? Joshua sneered. With West's ventures, they could rake in hundreds of millions in just three days. That small pile of cash could be used as tissues for all they care. Flynn took a glance at Ryan, who seemed displeased, and that was enough to send him trembling on the spot. No, I would never. Uh, please, have a seat. Let's talk about this over some alcohol. There's no need to be so tense. He awkwardly laughed. Joshua disdainfully glanced at the couch. I hope you don't expect us to sit on... He eyed the plush couch worth thousands. That! He spat out the word as if it was dirty. Flynn was immediately taken aback by his words. He spent at least 100 grand on that couch. But he pushed his frustration back and tried to uphold his appeasing behavior. Of course not. We have better chairs if you would just come upstairs with us. Ryan was growing impatient. He didn't have all the time in the world to waste with inferior people like this. Joshua sensed his temperamental boss's annoyance and decided it was time to finish the conversation. But Sam beat him to it when he walked into the room with a restless expression on his face. Hey, Mr. Piggy, can you shut up? Your squealing is pissing me off. Sam scowled, twirling the sleek switchblade with his fingers. Flynn felt his brows furrow upon seeing another disrespectful youngster. Kids these days really deserved a beating. 
How could they treat a senior like this? Hey, idiot! Sam's airy expression instantly turned sinister. Don't look at me! He snarled, throwing the knife right at Flynn, who screeched in fear, turning his body to narrowly avoid it. However, the knife still glanced past and sliced the side of his neck. Blood immediately spurted out. Upon seeing their boss injured, Silver Crown's men immediately lifted their guns again. But they didn't dare to point it towards Ryan. Instead, it was directed at Sam, who looked at the guns and boredom. Big boss, can I blow them up? Sam naively asked, tilting his head to Ryan. No, wait, I want to cut off the piggy's tongues first. It's annoying. What do you think about taking his eyes out? It'd be a nice treat for our bloodhounds. At his threat, the men shuddered. Had anyone else said it, they would think of it as an empty excuse. But Sam said it with nonchalance as if he'd done it many times in the past. Even though he was injured, Flynn still didn't dare to get offended or mad. He could only grit his teeth in fear and allow one of his men to step forward with some bandages. I apologize, young man. Did I say you can speak? Sam scowled. His face became twisted with displeasure. He reached into his pocket and pulled out another knife. Put it away. Ryan finally spoke up, his voice deep and devoid of any emotion. Combined with his grim eyes was enough to make Flynn quiver in his shoes. Sam pouted and shoved the blade into the pocket of his hoodie. Just wanted a new dartboard. He looked at his watch and saw it was almost the designated time he usually went to sleep. I want to go home already. In case your bird brain still can't figure it out, you messed with the wrong woman, Sam bluntly said. He too also wanted to rush the process. He had already missed his favorite cartoon by coming here. Sam heard a brief gist of why they came here when Joshua lectured him about it on the car ride here. Joshua didn't disclose who it was, so Sam thought it was his big boss's younger sister, Miss Frankie. Wrong woman? Flynn was momentarily confused, but then his eyes flickered. It couldn't be that woman, right? No, it couldn't be. It can't be her. The businessmen who commissioned them told them that aside from her influential grandfather, she shouldn't have any connections to the underworld. Besides that, her grandfather was supposed to only have military influence, not ties to the infamous West family. Y you don't mean... Oh, you know who it is? That's great! Sam clapped his hands together. So, who commissioned to have her harmed? I'm afraid that information is private. Flynn carefully said. He immediately regretted his words when Sam's giddy expression darkened. Would it still be private if I cut off your fingers one by one? Sam innocently asked. His words sounded like a genuine, innocent question. Flynn nervously swallowed, his beady eyes shaking. Ryan was growing tired of this confrontation. Take him to the base, he muttered, turning his back and swiftly walking out. Instantly, at his words, everyone from Silver Crown became guarded. But they couldn't react fast enough when the lights turned off and the doors slammed shut. Chaos erupted, and within two minutes, the door opened again. The lights flickered on, and the only men remaining conscious were all of Ryan's men.